So now I'd like to introduce you, Dr. Parag Patel. It's great to have you here. Uh, he's coming from the Wisconsin College of Medicine. Dr. Patel is an associate professor of interventional radiology. Uh, his topic today is on uh, indications and evidence uh, for a thoracotomy device. Thanks so much, Patel. <clears throat> Thanks, Marcelo. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this topic here. We are, um, this in theory should be a much shorter talk because the evidence with regards to atherectomy compared to what Brian just discussed on uh, uh, SFA stenting is much, much, uh, much more sparse. But what I hope to discuss in the next 10 minutes are what the theoretical benefits for atherectomy are for those of you that use them in your labs, whether we have technologists or physicians here. Briefly, uh, just list the different types of atherectomy, not each individual one, but classes, and then uh, discuss some of the historical and current data and maybe future studies that need to be uh, sorted out to help us direct treatment. So why do we use atherectomy devices currently? Uh, they've been around for some time, and theoretically they can remove plaque and calcium and therefore modify the lesion. Modification of the lesion may allow for a changing of vessel compliance, allowing you to do lower balloon inflation pressures or reduced barotrauma, so to speak, to the lesion, uh, or allow you to better uh, place a stent, if you will. And the theoretical advantage of maybe eliminating the plaque before you do an angioplasty so that you don't get plaque shift, which may, uh, in theory, uh, take at risk uh, side branches away. And ultimately, um, which I won't discuss in too much more detail, there's clearly a favorable reimbursement strategy to using this. Uh, and that may be the biggest driver of all of this, but let's go to data specifically. Um, oh, a word of caution, you have to be intraluminal for all atherectomy devices. So if you're subminimal, in general, these are not good devices to use. There is a disadvantage, I think, in general to atherectomy. Uh, we're not a high volume user, um, but in my hands and what I've seen in the literature, there's always some degree of distal embolization. And whether it's reported, um, uh, or not in the, some of the studies that have been published, uh, the use of embolic protection should at least be considered in, in the time of, uh, of use of atherectomy. What are the different types of, uh, of devices we have? There's directional atherectomy devices where you can, uh, with a cutting device uh, present, you can uh, direct this to the, uh, the atheroma and, and cut it, if you will. There are orbital atherectomy devices that spin and wobble, if you will, within the vessel itself, causing a, a, a luminal gain. There are those that are over the wire that have a rotational cutting blade a mechanism with an aspiration port proximal to that, in theory trying to aspirate some of the debris or atheroma that you are cutting away. And then there's laser devices as well, which is really more an atheroablative technology to try to eliminate the, uh, the atheroma. Very different devices in general, but these have been around for some time. And this is an old slide. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this and some of those are newer to the field. This is the Simpson atherectomy device. This is the initial publication, really just a technical note talking about how this device could be used and using um, an atherotome or cutting device, using a balloon to inflate it and push it up against the, the plaque and then using the cutting mechanism to cut the lesion. This is what the device looked like and it was first published in 1988. Uh, 87 was when it was submitted and so we've had over 25 years experience with atherectomy and clearly we should then, over 25 years' experience, have significant data. Um, and we'll see if that's truly the case. Well, if you look at that particular device, there, that was just the technical note. If you look at a first four-year experience uh, with this particular device, there was reasonable technical success. Uh, with this particular device, single center, mind you. There was a moderate amount of complications reported, 21%. However, at 13 months, or about one year, they reported about 92%. Uh, patency, which seemed reasonable, and there was some excitement about this potential new adjunct device uh, or, or uh, tool that we can use for atheromatous lesions. However, if you look at the exact same device done with a better study design trial published in 1995, and this is just a quick look at this, 73 patients were randomized to atherectomy versus POBA, plain old balloon angioplasty. And if you look at uh, follow-up duration, mean follow-up at 13 months, so about the same time as the previously single center experience that was reported, one year's time, defined by peak systolic velocity ratios, not uncommonly used in other studies. Uh, one month clinical improvement was, was positive, 89% and 97% respectively in both groups. But if you look at the patency rate of these treated segments at two years, based on ultrasound evaluation, 34% for atherectomy and 56% for plain old balloon angioplasty. Really not convincing data that this is really um, a useful tool. And ultimately, the conclusions of the authors was that atherectomy does not result in improved clinical or hemodynamic outcome um, in the same exact device as was previously reported. And this really brings to light the levels of evidence that we look at when we 
decide to make clinical decision making. Um, really the best levels of evidence, level 1A, is meta-analyses or those of randomized controlled trials. So I want to focus on that rather than single cohort studies or single series studies because really that shouldn't be the driver. Those should elicit the development of randomized controlled trials. Um, and so if we do that, um, I think Brian mentioned a Cochrane um, review. There was actually one published just last year for atherectomy itself. Uh, and I think they did a fairly nice job of this. So I'll review some of this because I think current data through 2013, they did a nice job of trying to review the relevant data in this space. They reviewed all data related to atherectomy devices through 2013, and they only looked at uh, eligible studies, randomized control trials, the highest uh, rigored study trials comparing atherectomy to any type of established treatment, whether it be angioplasty, stents, drug coated balloons, if it was available. What they found? Only four. Four relevant studies since the advent of atherectomy devices in 1987. A total of 220 patients and 259 vessels fairly equally distributed between atherectomy and plain old balloon angioplasty. Okay? And uh, and as I mentioned, the only options or only comparisons, comparisons were atherectomy to plain old balloon angioplasty. So not necessarily to some of the other types of devices, pl drug uh, nitinol stents, drug eluting stents, drug coated balloons have not yet been performed, and I don't know if they will. These are the references for you. You can uh, keep this or, or review those uh, on your time. That's just really a reference for the slides. If you look at these, uh, the data in aggregate, Technical failures, or, or in other words, procedural success with utilizing these devices for all four studies compared to angioplasty was essentially equal. So there wasn't one that was more favorable than the other. They could, you could perform both of these in, in most lesions. But let's look at patency rates. This is six-month data. And if you look at the forest plot on the right, really the aggregate data for those that looked at patency rates at six months, now mind you, only three of the four did, which is one of the, the pitfalls of, of uh, evaluating atherectomy devices. Not all the outcomes are the same, or the primary outcomes that are measured are the same, but these were equivalent. Six-month patency ratios equivalent. If we go out to 12 months, the lower forest plot, also equivalent. So only in the best studies that were performed did we see a difference? No, not no difference, no difference performed as far as patency rates. If you look at bailout stenting, in the only two trials that looked at this particular metric, there was clearly was a favorable benefit towards atherectomy. So there were less dissections in atherectomy and therefore the less need in theory, or at least angiographically, to place a stent. Um, and so that was definitely favored atherectomy. And in the same two studies that looked at balloon inflation pressures, there was a benefit to favoring atherectomy as well. So you could modify the plaque and therefore get a, uh, a balloon inflation to completion at a lower pressure than a de novo plain old balloon angioplasty. So in summary, Cochrane analysis felt that technical success, being able to perform the procedure, six and 12 month patency, uh, and six and 12 month patency were similar for both treatment arms. And there was a reduction in the need for stenting in the atherectomy arm. However, and, and balloon inflation pr uh, pressures were much lower with atherectomy. However, I didn't present the data. There was a trend towards more embolizations with atherectomy and more dissection with POBA, which probably lends to the need for bailout stenting in these patients. And in conclusion, they felt that the limited evidence does not support a significant advantage of atherectomy over conventional balloon angioplasty. That was as of data through 2013. What's more contemporary data that we have? So the definitive AR is a study looking at atherectomy followed by some type of anti restenosis therapy, okay? This hasn't been published yet, but it has been uh, presented recently. A prospective multicenter randomized pilot study looking at DART versus DCB. DART is considered directional atherectomy, utilizing in this case Silverhawk or Turbohawk, with some type of anti restenosis therapy, in other words, drug coated balloon. And in this case, this is PACOCATH, which is not FDA approved in the US. It's a European balloon. It uses Paclitaxel, which we believe is the best re uh, anti restenotic agent, and 121 patients enrolled in 10 European centers done outside the US. Their study design was as such. If you had highly calcified lesions, you went straight to the DART therapy. If not, you got randomized, and you can see the numbers in each group. This data was presented at Viva last year, and the primary outcome, the only primary outcome measure they were looking at was percent stenosis at 12 months. And the data suggested at 12 months for those two groups at 33.6 and 36.4%. So not particularly compelling for this, for this group. If you looked at subset analyses, and, and mind you, the study was not powered to look at that, longer lesions and those more calcified tend to favor the DART therapy treatment. But again, not powered for that purpose, so hard to make def definitive conclusions based on that. 
If you look at laser atherectomy, and I'll look at this in the last study, we'll look at more recent contemporary data, the Exmer laser randomized control trial for FEMPOP lesions with instant restenosis, 318 patients, 40 sites, randomized two to one, laser to control. Primary endpoints, efficacy and safety endpoints were looked at. If you look at these uh, results, procedural success was fairly high, 93.5% for the laser group versus uh, plain old balloon angioplasty. And the major adverse events in TLR at six months favored that of the instant res uh, favored that of the laser atherectomy followed by balloon angioplasty versus balloon angioplasty alone. The dissection rates and bail assenting were also lower in the uh, laser atherectomy group as well. And that also, mind you, led to the uh, FDA approval of that particular device, uh, the Exmer laser by Spectronetics for, and I, I have no disclosures with this company, um, for the use for this indication for instant restenosis. So there may be a role for that. But I want to go back in time again, prior to the Simpson atherectomy catheter. We know what the mechanism of balloon angioplasty is. There's been many uh, well-established data, and we go back in time, sometimes we forget about this, but in 1980, some animal work models to determine what actually happens with balloon angioplasty. And we know that with angioplasty, we cause some barotrauma, some injury to the arterial layers, and ultimately healing occurs. And if you look at animal models, that's been well documented, that that healing of disrupted arterial layers occurs by the formation of neointima and scar tissue. Clearly, that mechanism is not necessarily no different than when you cut the atheroma with an atherectomy device. You're going to have that mechanism occur. So while you may get a good angiographic result, what do we do about this process and how do we manage that? This is courtesy of my colleague Andrew Minsalt uh, up at University of Minnesota. But if you look at this and you take a vessel and it's got a lesion to it and you start cutting it with some of the other devices we had previously, you may get luminal gain. But in due time, whether it's at six months or 12 months, you will get some degree of intimal hyperplasia. There's some scarring that forms. So now we have newer devices that maybe take bigger cuts. But with bigger cuts, you still get neointimal hyperplasia. And maybe that still allows you some residual luminal gain that's better than the previous example, but ultimately may not be long-term results because that process can continue. So how do you minimize that? And it may be best suited with medical management, with uh, Plavix, um, uh, lipid controls and so on and so forth, or maybe directed uh, anti-restenotic therapies like drug-coated balloons. Still yet to be determined. We have no studies here currently in the U.S. that look at this therapy, that is atherectomy, with our current FDA-approved balloons. And if you look at the drug-coated balloon trials, there are clearly differences between balloons, whether it's the drug or the carrier and so on. So those work needs to, that work still needs to be done. As far as future applications, a combination of atherectomy with some type of drug delivery system, whether it's a drug-coated balloon or drug-coated stent, may have some benefit. You know, it actually takes the best of both worlds. It takes the atherectomy's ability to uh, get the uh, modest intraluminal gain without dissections, and then the, the anti-restenotic therapy of the drugs to try to inhibit that process. But we don't know that yet. That's a theoretical benefit. So currently in my practice, what are the conclusions I can draw the role of atherectomy devices? Generally, I use it in stent avoidance uh, areas, so no stent zones, maybe long segment diffuse non-occlusive disease where I think that uh, placing a stent is going to be best and I want to modify the ability to place that stent. So maybe an area that's significant calcification, I don't think I'll be able to get a stent open in a patient who I deem as an endovascular candidate. Debulking in ISR, some of the uh, more recent data with the laser atherectomy device seems to have uh, some merit. Uh, and then ultimately preparation for DCB in theory. Uh, if you can get a good nominal gain, you don't want to put a stent in, but you want to put a drug-coated balloon. Again, that has not been borne out yet. We still need studies to prove that. And with that, I'll leave you the last bit of data here and hopefully uh, submit to you what we have with atherectomy, which is not quite as detailed as the SFA. Thank you. Thank you.